Hi everybody, um, it's Melissa coming to you live, um, real live. Uh, as you probably noticed, I am not in front of the background that I normally am behind the AIM background. Um, I don't have my uh, equipment, so if you are having trouble hearing me or something crazy happens, that's why. So um, the reason that I'm coming to you in this very unconventional way is that I'm actually being a caregiver today. So um, ironically, uh, this morning, my fiance had to go to the ER and um, he's okay. Uh, but we got admitted to the hospital. Um, and so I'm actually <laughs> ironically playing the role that I was supposed to talk about tonight. So um, hopefully uh, things will go pretty smoothly. I'm operating without my tripod today. Um, if you can't hear me, um, please comment in the comment section. We'll try to correct that. But what we're here to talk about tonight is making sure that we take care of the caregiver. Um, I have some tips about how to do that. Um, a lot of times people forget um, that when they're taking care of someone, they actually also have to take care of themselves. Um, we are going to talk about some things that make that job a little easier um, for you. Uh, I definitely am you know, a physician assistant. I'm not a social worker. I'm not a therapist, um, but I have been a caretaker for my grandmother and my dad who both have had cancer, um, obviously for my fiance, um, and luckily not a, a chronic role. Um, and also I've kind of seen all of the do's and don'ts and, and good caregivers and situations where caregivers got into a lot of trouble while they were trying to take care of their loved ones um, during the course of their melanoma treatment. So um, hopefully I can offer some help in that regard. Um, I guess first, like who is a caregiver? It can be really be anybody that is taking care of someone, whether it be acutely, like after surgery, um, having to take a loved one or family member, a friend, um, neighbor to the hospital for an acute issue. Um, in this setting and, and what we're probably tuning in to talk about is caregiving um, in a chronic setting um, in a melanoma patient, um, which can really be at any stage. Um, people will have different needs. Uh, so your caregiving role will vary pretty greatly from person to person. Um, the caregiver can actually be one or more people. There's usually a primary caregiver. A lot of times um, in our practice, it's been a close family member, a spouse, wife, partner, um, a sister, brother, a lot of times kids take care of their parents. Um, but it's primarily the person who is on a daily um, or the majority of the time basis taking care of someone. This might involve um, driving people to and from appointments. It might be making food, picking up um, medicines. Um, it could be emotional support. Um, there's a lot of hats that the caregiver um, will wear throughout the course of, of their duty. Um, you're not going to know what to do, and that's okay. Um, the, some of the best caregivers had absolutely no medical background. Um, my future mother-in-law has no medical background. She was pretty amazing taking care of her husband. Um, she learned how to do all kinds of things. Um, and the thing that made her so good at her job is that she wanted to do it and she took care of him. And, um, you know, that's the most important part, being a good listener, making sure that you are um, listening when the doctor comes in and really just wanting to do it. Um, again, many, many jobs. Um, sometimes people will need help changing bandages and changing their drains or emptying drains. Sometimes you'll even have to administer medications. You might be the person that has to coordinate all the appointments and make sure that someone is there to pick people up and, and take them home. Um, a lot of times that unfortunately doesn't fall um, on the same person. So um, one of the best advices that I can give someone that is maybe entering into this role newly is to set up a support system of people that are going to help you because you cannot, no matter what you think, do this all by yourself. Um, like for example, today, even though, you know, this is a, a temporary one day thing, there was somebody to pick up my fiance's kids there. My mother picked up my daughter, um, from school. So, uh, you just, you need people to help you. Um, sometimes you may need to 
change your schedule around and at the last minute you need to know who you can call to help you with those things so um you know really have a team a team is really really important i'm sorry for the shaking my arm is shaking a little bit um so what are your jobs as a caregiver you're going to provide activities of daily living if a person needs help changing bathing all of those things making food that may be your job transporting emotional support this is really really important you want to make sure that you are when you're taking the job of being a caretaker for someone or a caregiver for someone you want to make sure that you are able to um, accept and deal with their emotions because there's going to be a lot of them you know a cancer diagnosis in general is not something that is easy it's not something that goes away um, you're going to deal with this for the rest of that person's life. So, um, there's going to be anger and fear and guilt and sadness and happiness. Um, but there's going to be a whole range of emotions and you have to kind of be ready to take on all of those things. Um, how do you do that? Uh, again, have a team, have a outlet. So, um, taking on all of those things from someone else, you also have to have someone to be able to outlet all of those things onto as well. Cause you're going to have feelings too. Um, one of the hardest things is that a lot of the caregivers that I come in contact with are like, I don't want to be sad in front of my husband, brother, sister. Um, I don't want them to know I'm scared. I don't want them to know that I am angry and um, worried. Uh, they can sense that. They know. Um, one of the things that would be a travesty is if you don't show them that you are in this together. So it's okay to talk about your feelings with your you know, person that you're taking care of. It's okay to be angry right along with them and cry right along with them. Um, one thing that is very important is that you don't overshadow their needs with your emotions. And if you find that you're doing that, it's actually one of the signs of um, caregiver burnout. So we'll talk about that a little bit later, but, um, you know, make sure that you have feelings, but don't be an overshare. Um, but it's really important to make sure that you, you do still engage with those things and it's healthy to have those feelings. Um, one of the, um, hardest things is when you're mad at the person you're taking care of. So a lot of times in this, you know, journey, you're going to encounter situations where they don't feel good. They might lash out at you. They might be angry in general about how things are going, um, and sometimes they don't want to eat and you might be frustrating them by telling them that you need to eat. Um, there's no, there's no way to make someone do things that you want them to. Um, there's no right or wrong way to feel. Um, each person that's going through this journey is going to feel differently. Um, so, you know, sometimes patients will express anger with family members that, they don't necessarily, they're not directing those feelings towards the right person. And um, we've been involved in the middle of a few um, family meetings that um, the caregiver and the patient just really aren't seeing eye to eye. Um, sometimes that involves getting a new caregiver and that's okay. Sometimes um, it's just a matter of kind of establishing where those feelings are coming from. Um, we just had a scenario where um, a patient was really, really angry with his caregiver and um, kind of caregiver team um, because they had contacted the doctor to tell them some symptoms that were um, happening kind of outside of his knowledge. Like they called the office behind his back kind of. Um, and so he was really, really hostily feeling towards them, um, but they didn't really understand why. Um, and so we kind of sat down and talked about it. And, um, you know, this is kind of part of your overall care in your oncology office as well. Um, if there are issues like this, you know, everybody's on the same team. We all have to work together to make sure that this goes well. So, you know, if there are conflicts between the patient and the caregiver um, that you just really can't resolve at home, it's totally okay to reach out for help, you know, whether that's you know, a social worker, your physician assistant, your doctor, um, another friend. Um, sometimes a third party can kind of see and sort through all of the, the issues. 
Um, but again, it's very, very normal and you should definitely talk about it. Um, if you get to the point where you're experiencing some caregiver stress or burnout, so this is not an easy job. Um, there are some risk factors that people, ex you know, that make people more likely to be, um, to develop caregiver burnout. Um, and that's like being a female, um, cause a lot of times females have a lot of other roles inside their family dynamic. Um, living with the person that you're caring for can, is, is a setup for caregiver burnout because you're on 24 seven. Um, having social isolation, like not doing things outside of your home with your friends or things that you used to do. Um, those are all really, you know, that's a really dangerous setup if, if your life completely re revolves around caregiving. Um, if you had a prior history of depression, um, if there are financial difficulties, which I'm sure that a lot of families um, experience because a lot of times and a lot of the caregivers um, are spouses. So um, a lot of times if especially the patient is very sick, a lot of times the caregiver will have to not work, um, might be on family medical leave that may not, you know, continue to be paid. Uh, so a lot of times um, financial difficulties play a high role and, and in every aspect of a relationship whenever there is um, stress from money, uh, that can bring a huge amount of stress into the caregiver role as well. Um, another thing that um, probably doesn't happen very often, but sometimes can, is not choosing to be a caregiver. So um, occasionally we run into situations where you're the only family member um, and caregivers feel compelled to take this role on even though they may not really want to. Um, so really that's a role that you really need to think hard about before you do. Um, things that you can do if you do find that you're um, experiencing depression, anger, um, not sleeping, um, not taking care of yourself <clears throat> are to accept help. Um, people are willing to help. Um, family members, friends, there are always people that are willing to help. You just have to ask for it. Um, again, you can't do this by yourself. This is not a one-man show. Um, you need to focus on not being perfect because there's no way to know the exact right thing to do in every situation. But the most important thing is that you care and that you try. Um, set realistic goals for yourself. Um, you know, you're not going to be able to know all of the answers and know what all the medicines are, um, but ask questions. We're going to go through in a couple minutes um, some things that will really help. Um, when you go to your doctor's appointments, which um, I found, you know, the best caregivers tend to do these things. Um, the other thing that, that is kind of important and it seems sort of stupid is make a daily routine. Um, know that, you know, when you're going to eat your meals, what your meals maybe are, who's going to bring those meals, who's bringing, you know, people to appointments kind of where your children are going. Um, the more routine that you set up, the less chaos will ensue, um, but also be okay if the routine fails. Um, just like, for example, today, I'm supposed to be at work. That didn't happen. That's okay. You know, we have, I'm lucky enough to have family member that family members that can actually help um, when situations like this happen. I have coworkers that picked up the slack and saw the patients that I couldn't see today. So, you know, you need to be okay when things don't go the way that they're supposed to. You might go to your appointment and they decide to admit your um, patient and then your whole day is messed up. You're, you can't pick your kids off the bus. You can't do the things that you normally would do. And you need to be okay with that because, you know, the day-to-day -day life of a caregiver is going to change. Um, there's also something called respite care that people may not know a lot about. Um, a lot of times um, there are agencies that offer this. It's actually um, someone who would volunteer to come, um, especially in, in a situation where someone is maybe at home and feeling really not well, um, where you're not going in and out of doctor's appointments. Um, respite care can be really helpful to give you some time to do self-care, to go to the grocery store, to take an hour and take a shower, um, have a cup of coffee and sit by yourself. Um, 
or if there are things that you absolutely need to do um, for yourself, like go to your own doctor's appointments. So um, respite care is really helpful in that regard. There's there's also inpatient respite care where you can actually have your um, person that you're taking care of go for like say a weekend um, if you need some time to go somewhere or if you like say your college age kid is graduating in another state and you need to go and, and you need somebody to make sure that they take care of you so or of your you know, caregiver person. Um, so respite care is something that a lot of people don't utilize, um, but it is available. It's something that the social worker um, in your office would be able to help with. Um, so um, that might be something that you want to look into as well. Um, okay, so some things that we wanted to kind of bring as a caregiver to your appointment. Um, oh my gosh, I'm tilting. Hold on. <laughs> there you go. Um, one of the really best well-organized caregivers that I've ever met um, had a notebook and a binder that she brought to pretty much every appointment from the time I met her um, until they stopped coming. Um, in this binder, they would ask for all the pathology reports, all the labs, um, any kind of um, scan reports, and she would three-hole punch and put them right in the binder um, and that way, if they ever had to go to um, a consult or any kind of um, other doctor's office that maybe wasn't um, planned, they would have all the results that they needed um, right there in their binder. Um, so they were always very, very prepared. Um, we had sent them to a pulmonologist once. The pulmonologist didn't get their records. She whipped them out of this folder um, and were all you know, were ready. She just handed them to him and said, here you go. And so it saved a lot of time for not only the care team, but also for her husband. Um, the other thing is that she would bring a notebook and in this notebook, hi Heidi, you're the best too. Um, in the notebook, she would write um, any questions that they came up with um, when he wasn't there. She would write um, symptoms that kind of came up because a lot of times, um, at least in our offices, sometimes we're not seeing patients for multiple weeks at a time. Um, and something might happen right after you were in our office that maybe came and went, um, and wasn't really, um, urgent or acute that you need to call the office, but write it down. Cause all those things are really important. Or like I had diarrhea for three days, but then it resolved on its own. Um, sometimes that's relevant, especially with these new immunotherapies that we have, um, knowing kind of patterns of bowel movements, um, things that you ate that kind of didn't agree with you, days you woke up when you had pain somewhere. Um, all of those things are really important. Um, and so she would write all of those things down and the dates that when they happened. And it was really easy to kind of follow the timeline uh, for what sort of happened when we weren't there. Uh, the other thing is she made a list of his medications and she slid it in the front part of the binder. And anytime it changed, she up, she would update it. Um, so that was always helpful um, in situations where, you know, we were changing things around. So um, have a notebook. In that notebook, you also want to make sure that you write down um, the plan. Um, one of the things that I think is really important is understanding what is happening for your care and making sure that you have all the things that you need. Um, one thing that we're going to try to start doing and that we have kind of started doing in certain situations is making a sheet of paper. Like when um, someone, for example, has colitis, um, diarrhea from immunotherapy or some other complication of immunotherapy, we actually make a sheet and it tells you exactly what um, steroids to take on which days, when to start them, when to stop them, other medications that you might take with um, the steroids. We say like, um, we list uh, side effects of the medications that we give on there, when it's important to call the office. Um, those are all really helpful things. Now, not every office is going to do that. Um, so what I have encouraged people to do um, it's keeping that notebook like these are the new medicines that were prescribed. These are some of the side effects that might occur from taking these medicines. These are the reasons that I would want to call the office. Um, you're not going to be able to remember everything, but the most important thing is that you ask questions um, if you don't understand, because the best way to be a good caregiver is to understand what you need to do. Um, one of the other things... Sorry, I thought we were going to have to jump off for a minute. Um, one of the other things that the notebook will help you with is kind of going back 
when you are home and knowing the things that um, the doctor might have said. And if there are gaps, jot them down in the notebook. So the next time that you come, um, you'll be able to ask. Um, I think that's you know, really, really helpful. Um, the other thing that this wonderful caregiver would bring is she would have like a little bag and she would put all of her stuff in the bag. So anytime that they went to the doctor, the folder was in there, the notebook was in there, she had pens in there. Um, and she had snacks and water. Um, and even if they left in an emergency, it was always in her car and she would pick it up and it was always there. Like every time I would go in the room, there was the bag. It had all the things she needed. Um, one of the other things that being a good caregiver, um, and Heidi, that's really you know a good point, is not being afraid to talk about alternative treatments. Um, it's kind of your job to ask about the things that maybe um, are tough. So um, things like medical marijuana, things like acupuncture. Um, you know, it's okay for you to think outside the box. It's okay for you to ask questions. That's kind of why you're there. Um, it's important to remember to um, to be your person's advocate. So even if it's something that's completely insane, um, at least you asked. Um, there's always things that maybe sound crazy to you um, that actually are very helpful. So be that person. Um, ask the questions that maybe your person doesn't want to ask. Um, one thing that I will say, um, you don't want to get on the internet as a caregiver and start Google docking everything. Um, I will tell you, you will freak yourself out. Um, and Google doc is not the answer. Um, you can always call the aim at melanoma, ask an expert line. I'm available to answer questions that you might have or things that, um, you might need educated on. Um, and it's a very good tool. I know some of you have probably called, um, one of the things that I love for my patients that I take care of personally is, and I probably say this at nauseum, is it's important for me to know that you understand what's going on because then I can take care of you better. Because if you understand why we're doing things and I understand why you're doing things, then it makes it a lot easier to work as a team and we can make sure that you know everything's happening the way that it's supposed to and if there's something that doesn't seem right probably isn't um, and we want to know about it so your role as the caregiver is to be that communication if the patient doesn't feel comfortable doing that so um you just have to plug away tim three and a half years you're doing okay you're still here and so that's a good thing um Yes, Heidi, you also don't want to be afraid to ask what happens at the end of life with cancer patients. That's something that um, I actually am setting up with our counselor and a social worker to talk a little bit more about hospice. That's something that I hope we're going to make available um, like in the winter months, like January, February, to kind of broach that subject. Um, in general, palliative care and hospice are extremely um, taboo. Um, people are afraid to talk about it. People are afraid of what that means. Um, I know that we are really trying to talk a lot about how to be a caregiver in a situation where somebody is actively going through treatment or maybe is in an early stage melanoma and, and what that means. And those are all important things. But one of the hardest jobs for a caretaker is that is end of life care. And I think that that would be a really amazing topic to just devote in and of itself because you're not prepared for this. No matter how much you talk about it, you're not prepared for this. So um, it's something that I think talking about really would help. Um, and hopefully, you know, if you think that that's something that you'd be interested in, comment um, below. I would love to do a whole Facebook Live on, on just that. So um, I was trying to look to see if there were any other questions. Hi, Debbie. Um, in here, um, some of the things that like questions that you want to ask, like, especially when you're going to talk about, um, like new treatment plans is like, what do we need to bring? How can we prepare for this? How long will the treatment take? Do we need to worry about driving on the day of the treatment? Are there side effects that might happen immediately on the day of treatment or in the couple days after treatment that we need to know about? A lot of times your care team will, will tell you those things but they might not. Um, 
there are some really good resources um, for caregivers um, t- that talk about not only like how to deal with stress, but also tips about like what things you want to ask. Um, on our Aim at Melanoma website, there is a whole section on patients and caregivers um, that you can li- click on. Um, it has links to other um, avenues like from the National Cancer Institute, Family Caregiver Alliance, um, the Caregiver Action Network, Cancer Care. Um, there's lots and lots of um, really good support systems for caregivers. Um, again, you can always contact um, me if you have any questions or if there's anything that I can do um, to help you. Uh, one other thing that I wanted to make sure uh, that we really, really quickly talked about, and I forget where I put it on here. See, I have notes. I always have notes about everything. Um, well, I guess we can go back to it another time. It must not have been that important. I, there was something on the tip of my tongue, and then I completely forgot it, but... Um, that's how the cookie crumbles whenever you're flying by the seat of your pants. Uh, so again, if there's anything that I can do to help, please let us know. Um, please reach out, reach out if you need help. Always remember that there is somebody that will be there to help you. Uh, real quick, I wanted to let you guys know that next month's Facebook Live is actually going to be on stage two melanoma and why it's so important and kind of what new things are happening. Um, That will be the week before Thanksgiving. So um, we'll probably do some promotion for that, but um, stage two melanoma specifically, we're going to do a whole Facebook Live on stage two. So um, that's in a month. Um, If there are other topics that you want to talk about or you'd like to hear about, please leave some information below. Um, If you have follow-up questions, please find me on the Ask an Expert link on aimatmelanoma.org. Um, and we'll get you taken care of. I hope you guys have a good night. I'm going to get back to my fiance now. Here he is. So nice. Hi. (laughs) Okay. See you soon.